Hey family, what's going on? Good evening, good evening, good evening. Fix my chair a little. I feel like I'm off center. Hey, I'm David Collins. I'm the pastor of New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Clydeville, Georgia. And I miss Joe. For real. How y'all been? Thank y'all. I love you guys so much. So, 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 so much. I forgot to put the welcome banner up. There go my name. Look, I'm a, you know, I'm a little out of the loop, y'all. Y'all got to pray for me. Um, thank you so much for being here with us uh, today for Bible study. It's good to see y'all. I see people checking in already. My mom's there, Denise Woods. And I see Sister Woods is, is in the building also. I know that means Deacon Woods is somewhere close. Who else is in here? I see Deacon Alexander, Deacon Johnson. I see my brother Quez, little bro, what's going on? And that means your mom is there, Diane. Hey, it's good to see y'all. It's good to be seen. It's good to be heard, man. Y'all just don't understand. I have been fighting bronchitis for the last couple of weeks. And if you get, if you ever know, you, you ever want to know what it's like, what, what frustration is, get a preacher so he can't talk. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. So uh, it's been, it's been wild, but God is good. God is faithful. And uh, I'm glad to be back in front of you teaching. Um, so part of me, if I got to take a few more breaks, I normally would for water or to cough. I'm almost back to myself, but not quite. So um, y'all please continue to keep me lifted in prayer uh, and uh, pray for all of us, man, for real. We're uh, taking a little break from our study of Luke. I know we only done chapter one, so I don't know. We'll see. I'm praying about what we're going to do going forward. But um, I wanted to take a break and um, and share something with you just kind of from my heart and um, in this Bible study. Um, yeah, I just want to just cut. Can we just talk? We family. We, we good, right? Okay. Facebook, YouTube. We cool. We can just talk. Mm -hmm. Um. I I had a whole lot of time to think over the last uh, few weeks because I couldn't do much or say much, get up and I'm winded going to the kitchen to get something to drink. So it gave me a lot of time to think and a lot of time to reflect and a lot of time to pray. And I came away so incredibly grateful. I came away so glad. I came away so humbled, so honored, so overwhelmed that God is as good as he is and he works in the way that he does. And I am so grateful for each and every one of you uh, for supporting um, the work of the ministry of the church of Jesus Christ. And I look forward to what God is going to do even more in us. And I just wanted to talk with you a little bit. Um, I, it, it, I was looking at some of the older videos as I was trying to keep you guys with something to watch on Wednesdays and Sundays while I was recovering. And, and we've been doing this uh, for over three years now. And that's just amazing to me. I mean, um, it's just amazing to consider that as a church, we went through, uh, gone through so much, you know, the end of 2019, we went through uh, a leadership transition to church. I come in as a first time pastor, you know, trying to get to know, trying to get to know what I'm doing, trying to, you know, to which, which everything was in was in was in flux, and then all of a sudden the pandemic comes and boom, we can't meet in person. And I, you know, at first I wanted, I, I, I'm like, I don't know how I did, I didn't know how we were gonna do it, except that I knew that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That's all I had, and y'all, that's all I needed. And so many of you, I know it's your testimony also, as we sit here considering. Uh, how we go forward as a ministry, I, I I think I would be derelict if I didn't stop and say how good God has been to us in the midst of a pandemic where churches are having to shutter their doors because they can't afford to keep them open. New Mount Zion is growing, got the nerve to be having new people joining and uh, and doing things financially in the church, being able to help people and being able to uh, take care of the of the church and upgrade and do things that make us more functional in the midst of a troubled time. And I just want you all, I just want you to hear me, man. I am um I'm overwhelmed. I'm so glad. I'm so happy. I'm so thankful. And you know, it's been 
What are y'all doing? Dogs down here at my feet, Momo and Kira. So if y'all hear them, that's who it is. Um, you know, so we've come through um an extremely challenging time in our relationship as a pastor and 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 and, and a church. And and even if you're not in South Georgia, North Florida, you still, if you're here, you're part of the Lord's church. And if you're a faithful follower of this ministry, then you part of the church too. Amen. Mm-hmm. But you know, we come through such a difficult time. And sometimes one of the hardest things to do when you've when you've come through something and you're exhausted, I'm coming through a sickness, I'm tired. We come through as a church, uh, you know, a pandemic and having to rebuild uh, essentially and 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 retool the ministry and all these things. Sometimes um, you've got to, it's a good time to stop and think and consider uh have I allowed God to do God stuff? Can I just tell you as a pastor, there's been a lot of days uh, that I have done, tried to do so much and I'm trying to be perfect in every way and I'm trying to control everything. And at the end of it, a lot of days I end up tired and don't nobody even know. I don't know. I'm not asking you to feel bad about me. I'm just being, we, we families, we can just talk here. I just want you to understand um, that, it is uh it's amazing when god puts you in a place to remind you that he was the one who was in charge anyway and i am so blessed to have the kind of uh, the kind of people the kind of church the kind of wife the kind of um deacons the kind of friends and family who make this thing look easy even when it doesn't always feel like it and because we are in a place where we're getting ready to, I sense, we were talking about it at the at our leadership meeting with the deacons yesterday, just feels like we're on the verge of some of some real of some new growth, some growing pains, some stretching out kind of thing. I'm just excited about that. And I want everyone to just hear my heart here that I'm excited and I want you to be excited. And that means and the reason I'm excited is because I know that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could think or ask according to the power that's at work in us. Y'all feel me a little bit like I am. He's done too much in my past for me to doubt him now. Amen, somebody. I'm getting to the lesson, I promise. And I want to be. I want to be the best pastor that I can be. I want to be the best leader that I can be. I want to be the best for you, I'm trying to be the, the best mentor, the best teacher, the best the best version of, of David Collins that I can put forward. And I thought about at first how, what I needed to do. And I realized that I had made I had made something all about me that wasn't all about me. So I wanted to involve you. Uh, in the process a little bit. I wanted to talk to, to just, just bring you in a little behind the curtain tonight. Um, and I want to, uh, I got this message titled, uh, help me help you. Help me help you. That's our topic for this evening. Um, I'm committed to serving God. I'm not, I'm not tripping. I'm not complaining. I'm not, I, I no and no Deacon Woods that had, I haven't had the hope beaten out of me yet. No, I am satisfied. But at the same time, I recognize that my tendency is to try to do everything. And I don't want to compromise ministry because I'm too prideful to say, man, I need some help. And if you got the Holy Spirit inside of you like I do, then you already know that we need each other in this thing. Even Jesus didn't try to do all they did alone. And I'm just trying to tell you that if you look to me as a leader, as a, as a, as a, as a teacher, as a pastor, as a, as a person of authority in your life, if you look to me in some way that you are looking to me for guidance, wisdom, follow me as I follow Christ, I can't do it without you. I'm just going to be real. So I thought we'll take a break from um, we'll take a break from Luke this week, and uh, and I just want to share with you a beautiful account uh, from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter seventeen. Um, 
Y'all see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. Let me put it on the screen for you. Uh, add to stream. And we'll do it like that. All right. Good. And this is a... Uh, I'll give you a little a little uh, context here in just a second, and we'll get through this message. I got like three or four points, and we'll be gone. So I'm tired, but it's, but God is good, and He He deserves my best. Amen. Verse eight, it's Exodus chapter seventeen says, "At Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Moses said to Joshua, select some men for us and go fight against Amalek tomorrow." I will stand on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Interesting battle strategy. Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought against Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he put his hands down, Amalek prevailed. When Moses' hands grew heavy, they took a stone. This is Aaron and her doing this. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat down on it. Then Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until the sun went down. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. How many of you know that sometimes you don't even know that there are folks behind the scene who are petitioning God, who are praying for you, who are trying to help you, serve you, that you don't even know that some man, you just don't know. But now you do because you're about to know because I'm going to talk about it tonight. Verse 14, the Lord then said to Moses, after they won this very improbable battle, write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. And Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. That's Yahweh Nisi. He said, indeed, my hand is lifted up towards the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. So reads the word of the Lord. I'm so excited. I'm excited about this word. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, just allowing us to be here in, in your presence, Father God, to sit under the under the, the watchful care of your word, Lord God. I pray that you would hide me behind the cross, Father God. Help me to be a help to your people, Father God. I pray that you would just bind us together with cords of love that cannot be broken, Father, to the end that on this day that we are brought closer together as a body of believers. Lord, you know we need you and can't do it without you. We can do all things through you who strengthens us, God. So we trust you implicitly. Have your way. Say what you want to say. I submit and surrender completely to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. So Exodus uh, 17, and I'm going to go from 8 to 16. We're going to teach all the way through that. And I'll, I may go back and forth between putting it on the screen. Uh, we'll kind of see how it goes. But um, in Exodus 17, we find ourselves in the beginning of the wandering years of Israel. So that means that Israel has spent time in Egyptian captivity, about four, about 400 years, all right? And in those 400 years, they grew in number, and uh, they, but, but Egypt treated them harshly, and they were, uh, and God watched for a time, but eventually he sent Moses to come and demand that Pharaoh let the people go. And after 10 plagues, one for each one of the false gods of Egypt, Pharaoh relented and let them go, but he changed his mind before they were good and off the doorstep and had them backed up against the Red Sea. And remember that it was Moses who stretched out his, his hand, his rod, and, 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 uh, and the Lord opened the sea, the Red Sea, and they walked over on dry ground. And the enemies that were behind them, that were trying to come and get them, once the last Hebrew was, over, was across to safety, as the Egyptian army came running through that corridor of sea, it fell in on them, crushed them and killed them. So these are folks who have been 
in unfair, unexpected, and unrelenting struggle. They've been going through it. And now they are just on the other side of the Red Sea. They've had a few times, they've, they've had a little time to go out. But remember, God has always taken care of them. He's when they didn't have anything to eat. Remember, they every time things get a little hard, just like we are. I'm not trying to trip on the on the Israelites because I'm not I'm not any better than they are. They would at first they would they were like, well, you know, why would you bring us out here just for us to die at, at Pharaoh's hand? Then they get across and they sing this beautiful song. And then they get out into the wilderness for a little while and they start running out of food and water. But God sends manna from heaven and makes the water that was bitter sweet so they could eat. But, you know, sometimes it's just hard when stuff happens to keep your spirit. Sometimes it's just hard to focus. And, and Moses is, 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 has got this group of about 2 million people or so, a mixed multitude, because it wasn't just uh, ethnic Jews that came out, but people who were, other, who were slaves from other nations also came and joined into the Jewish diaspora. So they get across and we come to, and I'll show you in the text. Let, let, let me, I'll, I'll pull it up and show you in the text what I'm saying here. Let you see this. So if we go to the beginning, we see that. So they were in the wilderness, going from one place to the next. They camped at Rephidim, which means like a camping spot. Uh, you know, it's a short stay. But there was no water for the people to drink. So the people complained to Moses, give us some water to drink. And Moses says, why, why are you complaining to me? <laughs> Moses said, why are you testing the Lord? So the people have come through and seen God do so much. But it is human nature sometimes that we want to see. I need just a little more proof. I need just a little more evidence. I need another encouragement, Lord. I just, I'm struggling again. I know you always taken care of me. I know when everything looked like it was falling apart, you had me, but Moses is starting, you already starting to see his, his frustration. He said, why are you complaining? We just came out that God literally gave y'all bread that fell from heaven, sweet tasting manna and purified stagnant water for you. But the people thirsted for water and they grumbled against Moses. Thank y'all for not being like that, New Mount Zion. Mm, y'all so good. I've talked to some friends, but never mind. But they grumbled against the person they could see because they couldn't see God to fuss at him. And they said, why did you even bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock that we would die with thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people in a little while, they'll stone me. The Lord said, go on ahead to the people and take some elders of Israel with you. Take the staff you struck the Nile, uh, you struck the Nile with in your hand. Your staff. The same one that he was walking up with. That God turned into a serpent. The same stick that he had been carrying just to support himself when he was a shepherd out in the wilderness. When he ran up on Mount Sinai to a burning bush and had this encounter with God that changed his life and turned him from uh, from, an, from a convict on the run to the deliverer of two million people. He says, take that staff with you when you go. And I'm going to stand there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. And when you hit that rock, water will come out of it and people will drink. Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites complained and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Let me pause real quick there and just let you know that there are, uh, even right now, there are archaeological digs going on in the um, in the Middle East. And they're, they're looking for the exact site of that. And uh, I was watching David Guzik. Pastor David Guzik did a, uh, did a trip over there. And he was in Jordan. And he was in Saudi Arabia. And I think Syria also. And they went to a site where they really believe that there was... Um, this that that it looked like the kind of place that is described in scripture. And they found this large, this huge rock that had tremendous erosion all around it that seemed sudden to the geologist. So if you say that there's no evidence for the Bible, it might be because you're not studying that much. But imagine 
So he, he, he hits this rock with his stick and there's enough water that 2 million people stop complaining about being scared of dying. I need y'all to see that. This isn't just a little drip. This is 2 million people who all of a sudden aren't going to stone their leader because now they trust that he's probably going to be okay. And Moses says to, he, he says it as a reminder, we're going to remember this place. We're going to call it complaining and forgetting. They're going to remember that because y'all act like the Lord ain't with you. Now, I remember that Moses' attitude gets him in, in a whole lot of trouble 40 years later when they come back to the same place. And instead of doing what God says, he does something totally different. Maybe we'll do that next week and watch the other side of it. Mm, we'll see. We get to our text today. So this is where we are when the, when the, Amal- uh, the, when the Amalekites roll in. Uh, that's the context for this. Let me, uh, no, that's fine up there like that. The, the context for this is that they've come through a point of slavery and now they're free. They've watched God's miracles over and over again, but they're human. So sometimes it don't always stick. And now they've come to this place where the, where the, where they're tired, the leader's tired, but God is somehow keeping them together. Y'all feel me a little bit? I got these little points and I want to get you out of here. It says at Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Now, where did they come from? (laughs) Now, Israel, they, they out there barely making it. God has given them only enough for the day, just giving them this day, their daily bread. He's sustaining them miraculously, and they are going back and forth. They're starting to argue amongst each other because the struggle just seems so intense. They got internal issues going on. And we sometimes struggle like that too, don't we? Have internal issues. Sometimes when things go wrong, you instead of just instead of crying out to God, sometimes we fuss at each other. But I'm glad that God provided a way. I think he said that he'll make a way in the wilderness and he'll make rivers in the desert. I guess God really meant that when he told when Isaiah had him when he had, we told Isaiah that that he really would do that. God wasn't just using that as a metaphor. He really meant it. So God says to these people uh, that Moses said, "I'm going to name this place to remind you of how you didn't trust God." That's okay though. We gonna, we, we still gonna move. Not a big deal. I'm not tri- I'm not tripping. I'm glad that New Mount Zion ain't like these Israelites. You're not. Y'all wonderful. But at Rephidim, Amalek came and fought against Israel. Amalek, uh, that's the, those are the descendants of Esau. Jacob, who would become Israel, his twin brother Esau, that have been beefing since they were in the womb. Out of nowhere, Amalek shows up. Israel's trying to pull themselves together. That's what I'm saying when I, when I look at this. I know this ain't about that this passage isn't about me, but I can't help but see the similarities between somebody who's gone through an internal struggle, and then we have this tremendous external struggle that attacks us just as we kind of pulling it together. Hello, somebody. So it's important that we be able to. We got to be on one accord so that when the external attack comes, when the pandemic hits, when the economic downturn comes when whatever that we are strong and settled in ourselves and i'm glad that they were at that refidim they were at that camping place they were huddled together so that when an external enemy came to attack them unprompted out of nowhere they didn't trip and turn against each other and that's so good so then we look at what happens next this army comes and is running in on them. Now, remember, this is not a bunch of trained warriors. This is not a bunch of hardened soldiers. This is a bunch of people who were just a few weeks ago slaves. And now they're free trying to trying to trying to come back together and, and have some semblance of a spiritual and national identity. And now Moses, who at this point is in his 80s. Is walking ahead of them. And trying to calm the roar of the crowd. And here comes an army. An army of out of nowhere of folks who are. Could have just. You feel me? Mm -hmm. So Moses says to Joshua, select some men for us and go fight against Amalek. So if you want to help me help you. I I think you do. I pray you. do. The first thing you got to be is present. 
I got four things you can be. And we're going to get out of here. If you want to help me help you, if, if you if you if you have, as I believe God has led us to this place and, and, and has brought us to this place with me trying to help you as I am clinging on to God with white knuckle grip on him, just trying to touch the hem of his garment. I need you to be present. If you want to see this ministry grow, if you want to see us flourish and we and 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 the and the place really be doing that that growing in in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the bat, all of those things. First thing you got to do is, is, is be present. You got to be present. What does that mean? Where's that in the text? When a, when a problem came, Moses had somebody to go to. Not only did he have God, but he had people. He had someone reliable, Joshua, who would late, who would at some point would take over for Moses. Forty years from that, from from now, at the same place, Joshua would take the reins from Moses, and he would lead the people into the Promised Land. Now they're at their first battle, and we see Joshua's war general status starting to show up. Amen. We see Joshua's status as a warrior begin to arise, as a leader begin to arise. Moses says, Joshua, go get some people to go fight against Amalek. They're coming at us tomorrow. I need you on the battlefield and I'm going to be on the on the hilltop with God's staff in my hand. Just a minute ago, God said, take your staff, hit the rock. I don't want to get too deep into it. But now it's God's staff. Now he recognizes this thing ain't just a walking stick. It's the instrument of God. But I just need you to understand that the first thing you need to be able to do is be present. If you want to see the ministry grow, don't leave it on the leader to do everything. And I love that you, that, that, that's, that, I, that we got people here in this ministry. But I want you to know, even if you are, because here's what happens. Because we've come through this pandemic, because these people have come through slavery, because they've been used to just going through the motions, sometimes it's hard to to, to remember that if I don't move, it might not get done. That if I don't move, it might not get done. So I just want to encourage you that even if you're watching us online, even if you are, um, even if you're not able to come physically to the church, if you are, please do, because there are some things that just can't get done unless you are there to take hold of them. Because Moses couldn't be in two places at the same time. He couldn't be on the hill praying to God for strength and also in the valley in the fight. At his age, as his experience level, and, and as his position as a leader, he needed people to be present. Not only did he have Joshua, who was willing to go and fight, it says in verse 10 that Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought against Amalek with while Moses, Aaron and her went up to the top of the hill. So Moses not only has someone who he can trust to to make to make sure things are right, even if he's not there. He's got some people who can go up and support him while he does the work of the Lord. I just need you to understand, y'all. We can't do this alone. I can't do this alone. If you think that that New Mount Zion is has come this far and has and what we've accomplished in the last three years is is, is has anything to do with me? Oh no, you missed it. No, 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 no. It's been because there are people who are working behind the scenes. There are people who are uh, who are holding me up in those in those moments. Oh, you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. So. The first, and I've heard this said, and it's true, one of the best abilities is availability. In some places, you just need to be present. Looking for an opportunity to make sure that if there's a need, that you're there to meet it. All right? Number two, you don't just need to be present. Number, uh, number, number two, you need to be perceptive. Not only do you need to be present, but you need to be perceptive. That means that we've got to be paying attention to the needs of the work of the Lord, even if we're, even if it seems like it's getting done okay. While Moses, so remember, Moses is at the, uh, what I, I, was, I don't think I got a, I don't got a staff. I'll just use my hands. That's okay. I don't want to be a distraction to you. While Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, but whenever we put his hand down, 
His hands grew heavy and Amalek prevailed. So I need you to just get a picture of this. They're at this place overlooking the battlefield and Moses is doing the best he can at 80 to hold his hands up. He's got this staff in his hand and he's holding it up. Now, the way that Jews prayed is not the way that you see um, in Western art that people pray like this. In America, a lot of times you see people praying like this, with their head bowed and with their hands together. Jews did not pray like that. Uh, Hasidic Jews don't pray like that right now. The way that they typically prayed was with their hands in the air and their face to heaven because they were trying to connect to the God who they were begging to take care of them and who they knew would deliver what they needed. So they had their hands up to surrender to God, their ability, and to receive from God his provision. So Moses is, 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 is in a position of prayer on the mountain. While there are folks who are doing the work, Moses is up there doing the spiritual warfare. And even though he's a little disconnected, it seems, from the battle, Moses is making a difference in what he's doing and they're paying, somebody's paying attention. Oh, praise God for people who are attentive. When they see a need, they meet the need. They notice that something is going on. There's something that needs to be done. It says that when, so, so, so here they are, they're paying attention to the way the battle is going. Do, do you pay attention to what is happening in our ministry? I'm not saying you're not, okay? I'm, this isn't an attack thing. That's why I'm not fussing. That's why we're just talking, right? We're just talking. We, we all need to be aware, paying attention to what is happening. What are the needs? What is God doing in this moment? And here we see that Moses recalls as he writes this down, that while his hands were up, they were prevailing. But as they started to, shake and get tired because he'd been up there all day. This is not some short battle, some five minute skirmish. This was a day long battle and they're fighting against hardened warriors and they are exhausted slaves. So we got to be perceptive, paying attention to the nuances of what's going on. Number three, you got to be practical. Ooh, you got to be practical. It is sometimes tempting to be there and be paying attention, but then it seems like, I don't know. I just got I'm watching the train wreck. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I can, I don't, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to get in the way. But I think if you, if you notice here, there's no conversation going on between Moses and Aaron and her. They're watching and they're responding according to the needs of the people. It says that when Moses' hands grew heavy, they saw Moses struggling. They saw what Moses saw. They saw that he needed his hands lifted up to God because they were not qualified to win this battle. They didn't have the soldiers. They didn't have the strength. They didn't have the stamina. They didn't have the strength of heart. They were just, they just got done getting ready to stone Moses. When his hands grew heavy, they got practical. And sometimes in ministry, I need you to understand that it is good to be practical. They could have sat back and, and prayed, watched him, judged him, ran down the hill and said, look at him, old self. He can't do it. I told you he was too old to be the leader. But instead, they saw the need and then they met the need without even having to be asked says that when they saw his hands grow heavy, they took a stone and put it under him. So Moses was standing there for hours, shaking, holding on, trying to do all he can. We can't do that by himself. Moses was, Moses was doing the best that he could, but how many of you know that you are not going to be able to do everything by yourself? And I don't want y'all to ever, please don't ever believe that I believe that I'm going to be able to do the work that God has called us to do in ministry by myself. 
If you see a need, if you see me struggling, if you see that, that we're going through as a ministry, as we're growing and people are coming in and we need somebody to help do this, help us seat people, help park cars, help do whatever it is. We need to be paying attention to what's going on around us because sometimes it's just practical. They put a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And then Aaron and her supported his hands. One on one side and one on the other. Because they recognized that it doesn't matter who gets the credit, because at the end of this, it's about God getting the glory. So if it means that we got to help. I'm going to help. And Moses isn't lording it over them. Moses isn't saying, y'all better make me look good. No, he's fighting for his life and for the lives of the two million people whose lives are at stake below. But I just love that he's got a trusted inner circle. Oh, like Jesus did. Matthew 26. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? He had a bunch of the disciples out there. You know, all 11 of them were out there. Judas had run off already. And he says, Peter, James, John, y'all come with me. I'm getting ready to have, about to have a mental breakdown. I need y'all to come in here with me. And I need you to pray with me. And, 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 and we all need to have in our lives some people who we can call on, who will support us and strengthen us and be there for us and be willing to do the work to support us as we support the ministry of God. And I'm just telling you, I need that help. I'm not saying that I don't have that. Ain't nobody helping. That's not uh, to be. I want to be very clear. I'm not saying we got a problem. I'm just saying as we go forward, I don't want us to get to the point of burnout before we say, hey, let's slow down and see why Pastor Collins is, uh, you know, having a nervous breakdown. I'd rather we start talking about the needs right now before they even show up. So let me just review. Number one, you got to be present. If God has called you to be a part of this ministry and God has called you to to participate, it's not just to be here, to be present, but you also got to be perceptive, paying attention, seeing what's going on. And then if you see the need, you might be the only one who sees it. You got to be practical. They were willing to stop doing what they were doing and attend to the needs of the people. That doesn't mean Y'all, I need people carrying my Bible and holding my, I don't need no armor bearer. I ain't carry no armor. That's not what I'm talking about. But in situations where all of us know that we are in the midst of a struggle for the cause of Christ, it's good when some folks are willing to say, I'll make that happen. And now remember, while this is going on, Joshua and the people fighting down below have no idea this is going on. They know Moses is up there, but they don't. But there's nothing that suggests that they saw the ebb and flow of the battle being uh, hinging on the strength and the and the ability to hang on in Moses's arms. People don't always know. Oh, but it's always worth it. If you're a leader and you feel like. People don't know how hard I work, so that I, I so I don't want to do it. You ain't you, you got to fix yourself because it's not about people seeing how hard you work. Moses wasn't trying to call attention to himself; he was just doing the work. I'm trying to be like Moses. I don't want. I want to be like Moses this time, not Moses forty years from now when he's when he's so mad and 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 got his mouth twisted like he's been sucking on sour lemons. Now, now I want. I like this Moses who's just who's like, let's get it done, Lord. If you do it, it'll be well. If you don't do it, I know that that that. that but you can do all things, Lord. So God, I just need you. And even when my, when I get weak, even when I can't talk, even when I'm when 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 I'm just the one person, when I'm struggling with my own stuff, you know, bronchitis didn't tell my PTSD to take a break, man. Sometimes it gets hard, and I just love that I got folks that were calling and texting, checking in, praying for me, praying with me. Oh, I love y'all. I love y'all so much because, like Moses, I enjoy having people in my life who are not just committed to me, but are committed to the ministry. I, I could be gone tomorrow, but people who are committed to the cause of Christ makes this thing work and it's practical. They supported his hands. The last thing you got to be willing to do, and I want you to see this, is that you, if you want to help me help you, I need you to be persistent. I need you to be persistent. 
that means that uh, it's good to be paying attention. Present. Okay, I'm here. B, two, <laughs> be perceptive. I'm paying attention. Practical, I'm willing to do the work. But persistent means I'm willing to finish the work. I'm willing to commit to the cause and do my part until it's done. That meant that the soldiers needed to fight while it was going on. Even when they got tired, Joshua needed to coordinate battle movements, even if the thing was going all day. Because you see verse 13, uh, verse 12, it says that, his, that they were up there till the sun went down. Mm. So, we, so I got to be persistent, but I need you to help me help you. Because Moses is not up there doing this for his own benefit. Moses is up there fighting. And, and while they're down there fighting, Moses is up there praying and seeking the Lord's help. They are doing the natural and Moses is doing the supernatural. They each have their part to play. Not one is better than the other because if nobody fights, ain't nothing happening when Moses lifts his hands. And if Moses will lift his hand, the battle was going to be done. God had a way that he wanted to coordinate the abilities and the availability of his people to show them the kind of thing they would need for the next 40 years of wandering and warfare. Do you have the persistence? That's one thing. You want to help me help you? I need some folks that are willing to stick to it. That's how we got through the pandemic. People who would come and pray every day when we were doing that. Yeah, that, was, that was lovely. I need some people who will, who, who will keep on checking on folks. Even if they hadn't been to church in a while. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep work. I'm going to keep checking. Who supported the ministry even when, it, when, when we weren't opening our doors and you didn't know what, when we were. It's just beautiful to have some folks who are willing to stay the course. Jesus asked those, those same disciples, remember in Matthew 26, in the garden, he said, "They y'all couldn't hang with me one hour, huh? Now you came and you watched me, but it was just hard. It's just hard when I, if I got, if I, because I can't do it by myself. I don't need to be, Moses wasn't talking about, he said, I just, but there's folks that are going to die if we don't do what we do in here. And we can't give up before the battle is over. But the battle is already ours in the Lord. I think that somewhere in the Bible, it says that, no, in all things, we're more than conquerors. That we are uh, that we are already victorious, that we are perpetually victorious in Christ Jesus. So if you want to help me help you, I need you to be persistent. If you say you're going to do it, I need you to follow all the way until you see the battle end until we get to the next one so that we can, so that we as a people, because this ain't about me as a person. I'm just telling you because God's got me to get up there holding the stick so that we as a people can come through this. It requires that. This is not Pastor Collins, uh, you know, list of things that, that I would like to have. This is, this is remember that the point here is that there is an external attack on the people. And they got to come together, everyone in their respective positions. And they got to do these four things. They got to be present. If you're not there, somebody's not going to be taking up that. Somebody, somebody that's, a, that's an empty place in our phalanx. So that's somebody's shield who's not held up. You got to be perceptive. You got to be paying attention. It's not enough to just come in, come to church, get my shout on, hope they play my song. Hope, hope he say I hope he says that they no, I'm paying attention. I'm listening. I am looking. I'm paying attention. Who's that? What do they got? They got a bulge under there. Is that a gun? I don't I don't know. What am I, I you gotta be paying attention. And as you're paying attention, you gotta be willing to be practical. Aaron and her knew. I see the connection between the movement of this battle and the strain of the leader. I got to I got to make sure that that we get through this. And they held him up and then it says that they held his hands and his hands were steady. All the way to the sun went down. From first thing in the morning to the setting of the sun. They held on. And they were persistent. I want to show you how this ends and get you out of here. 
So Joshua defeated Amalek and his army with the sword. Now, remember, these are untrained slaves who were making bricks before this. And they were not warriors, but they won in a battle. I just need you to understand that from the beginning of this all the way to this point, it has been God who has been fighting the battles. Sometimes you got to be still and know that I am the Lord. Be still and know that he is the Lord. You can trust God. He says, <laughs> then the Lord said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua that I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. He said, make sure that Joshua understands what happened here, that this was not a fluke, that this was not just this was not just dumb luck, that I was working in the midst of this battle and that enemy that attacked you, that that that, that came against you, that came against the against my people. The Lord says, I'm going to take them out completely. They had left a place that Moses just got done calling, uh, complaining and, and forgetting. Moses built an altar there in response to God telling that they should remember it. And he named it one of the names of God that we know now. This is the first time we see it used in scripture. Yahweh, Jehovah Nisi, my banner, my flag. He said, indeed, my hand is lifted up towards the Lord's throne. The Lord will be at war with Amalek from generation to generation. I don't want you to miss, I don't want you to miss in this message that this story is not about Moses or Aaron or her or Joshua. This story is about how God uses flawed, tired, tripping, messy, worn out, frustrated, old, young, inexperienced people to do his ultimate will. God told God said that my word never returns to me empty. It will always accomplish what I set out for it to do. Sometimes we just got to get out of our own way and get in position to be fruitful member of the body of Christ. That's what I got to do. That's what I got to work on. I can't be Moses. I can't be up on the, I can't be doing everything. You can't be doing everything, but we all need to be in position. So how do we tie this to Christ? It's the Old Testament. How do we, how do we find our way back to the cross? Two, two ways. There's, there's a bunch of them, but certainly uh, there's two. I think Moses think not what what was that boy? Let me look. Let me play with it. What's that boy's name? What's that boy's name that was down there fighting while Moses was there praying? Mm-hmm. Joshua. Joshua. Yeah, that's it. Joshua. 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 Now that now. Now I'm not that smart, but I, one of the things I know is that Joshua. Is the he in Hebrew? We just you know Americanized it, but that's Yeshua. It, it, his name means the Lord saves. So while Moses is up, disconnected from the worst of it, Yeshua is down fighting the battle that Moses is not qualified or equipped to handle. Doesn't mean that Moses doesn't have a function because while Yeshua is fighting the battle, Moses is seeking the Lord. And I need you to understand that God is your banner just as he was for Israel in the Old Testament. And that while you are doing, you do your part. What is my part? What is my part in salvation that I come to God empty handed Lord. I need you to overcome death, hell, and the grave. I'm a sinner. I offer you nothing. I need you to help us through this time. I'm not qualified. This is my, I, 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 Lord, if you don't do it, it won't happen. But God, this is all I have. And while 
we're somewhere shaking and people holding us together. Yeshua. That's also the same name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Same Hebrew name. That while we're seeking the Lord, doing what he's asked us to do, that he's fighting battles that we are not able to fight. Number two, I think it's interesting how it doesn't look like the battle hinges on Moses if you're not paying attention. If you were watching what was going on, if you were watching the ebb and flow of the battle, you might be wondering how did they, how are these untrained people fighting against this hardened army for so long? But what you don't know, what, what some people didn't know, and Moses wanted to, and God told Moses, write it down so people know what happened up here, is that while whatever is going on, the real, the, the, the deciding factor is somebody on a hill. While, while men are toiling and fighting against each other, we have to remember that our battles are not against flesh and blood, but they're spiritual. That while a whole bunch of other stuff is going on, there's a man somewhere on a hill with his hands outstretched, crying out to God. Now Moses was standing up there silently with Aaron and her to hold his arms up, but on a hill called Calvary, a few hundred years later, 1,500 years or so later, Jesus would be on a hill fighting the spiritual battle for the entire world. Even while folks down there didn't know exactly what he was doing, Jesus was out there, but he didn't have anybody to help hold his hands. So Roman soldiers put nails in his hands to hold them to the cross. Nails in his feet to keep him erect on the platform. And while we were yet in sin, Jesus Christ was busy up there dying for the ungodly. I am so grateful that in the times when we feel like the world is going crazy and we don't know how we're going to make it and defeat and, and, and humiliation and whatever seems like it's just a matter of time there's a real battle going on that don't nobody know about. And I want you to know that in the battle for your spiritual life, for your worth, for your eternity, as much as you are doing the best you could, and yes, you should, the real work was happening on a hill with a man with his hands outstretched who wasn't fighting the way we fight. He was busy saying, forgive them, Father, because they don't even know what they're doing. I am so grateful that I serve the kind of God who looks at me and sees someone worth fighting for. That's why I fight so hard for him. That's why I fight so hard for you. That's why I'm, that's why I'm, that's why this matters. Because God, who's the creator of the universe, set everything in motion, has all powers, perfect in every way, cares about me. That if I just believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, that I really believe that Jesus lived a sinless life as God and man in the same time. He was really born of a virgin, that he really that he really did go and face the penalty that I deserve on that cross. You mean to tell me that while I'm down here losing the battle, God is up there winning the war? Look, the best part 
of this whole thing is that at the end of it, there's not a coronation ceremony for people, but they dedicate the battle to God. And he says, what I've taken away from this experience is that God, you are my banner. When everything is down, I don't look. I, I, yeah, I look around and make, but, but, but the first place I look is up. I look to the hills where my help comes from. All of my help comes from the Lord. And if all of us can take on that attitude, not just the the, the leaders or the people who always seem to be doing stuff, but if we can get everybody in place. I know that as God, he said, Jesus looked over the masses and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send the laborers. And I'm appealing to you, even if you didn't know it, that this ministry needs your gifts. Nobody's got all of them except God. So we need you. And if you're thinking, I am not good enough, Jesus paid the price for you. So whatever it is that you think that you have done that has disqualified you from being able to adequately serve and worship and work for him, he paid it all. And because of that, we owe it all to him. And Jesus, he really did die on that cross. A Roman soldier stabbed him in his side and Water mixed with blood came out. They didn't know what that meant in the first century, but we know now that that means that you've had massive heart failure and that your blood and the liquid in your, in your body have already begun to mix because it's no longer flowing through your veins. He was dead. The wages of sin is death. So Jesus died the death you deserve, but the gift of God is eternal life. Now, Jesus, if you're dead, how are you going to give me life? I'm glad you asked because they put him in a, but in a tomb, a very prominent tomb of a well-known man named Joseph of Arimathea, and they put and they, and they put the uh, the hundred or so pounds of uh, of, spy, uh, of herbs and all that other stuff around, and they wrapped him up like a mummy, and they put him like where they put people who are supposed to stay dead. They rolled a thousand-pound stone in front of this cave, and they put a Roman guard you know, the, the, the best of the best of the best, the people who defend Caesar in front of it because Jesus said he wasn't going to stay dead. And three days later on the day that we recognize as Easter morning, when they looked inside the tomb with the stone rolled away, Jesus was not in there. He was alive. He had not only paid the price for your sin, but he proved his power, authority, and divinity by defeating even death. And he didn't just allegedly, it's a historical fact. People died. People like Peter and people like Paul and people like Stephen died because they testified they had seen the risen Christ. And he walked around for about 40 days. And, and Paul says that when he writes to Corinth, he said that he showed himself to about 500 people at various times in various places. I serve a risen Savior who has done the fighting for me and come through victorious. So now it comes to us. What do we do with this information? What do we do with this? How do I respond to a God who loves me this much? I'll never be able to get it right. Jesus said, it's okay, because I'm going to send the helper. That's the Holy Spirit. He'll live on the inside of you. When you're, you, and Paul said in Ephesians 1 that you'll be, he'll seal you. You'll be safe, guaranteed, no doubt about it. Your salvation is secure in him. The gifts of the Lord are irrevocable that I'm good, I'm saved in Christ, and I'm empowered by his Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of me and helps me to do what? To help other people to see the same thing. To be as Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 14, -ish, uh, that you're the light of the world. You're not saved to sit. You're saved to serve. And there's nothing standing between you and a holy God 
now that Jesus is your intercessor. So I don't, so, so I come just as I am and he makes me better than I've ever been. So here's what I want to say to you. Listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day to get to know him. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to know him today because there will be battles. There will be times of depression you're going to go through. You're going to walk through some valleys of the shadow of death. Life don't make sense. Doesn't seem fair, except that we know that in the end, justice and love and peace and God triumph over evil. That those who who even that, that those who have done evil and who have attacked God and his people eventually find their reward in a place called hell where they are eternally separated from God. That's the place that we deserve for thumbing our nose at God and saying, I'm going to do it my way. Oh, but for those who wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll. Oh, they'll listen. You can put your faith and your trust in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, today. Making a confession that, Lord, I am no good. But I trust you that you lived a perfect life. You taught wonderful teaching with authority that no one has ever had. And I trust you with my eternity. And God will take away your stony heart. And give you a heart of flesh. Yes, he will. How do I, how you know, Dave? I'm living proof. I'm telling you because the only reason I'm here is that he is good. So if you don't know Jesus, today is a good day. Best day of your life to get to know him. I just dropped the Zoom link in the um in the comments. And I want you to know that. This is a good day. Now is a good time to make your commitment to God sure so that you know that you've got a battle that is won in Christ Jesus. And I just want to talk to you about it. That's all. I just want to talk to you. I want to help you. I want to pray with you. I want to make sure that you understand the gravity of this situation, that what you're being saved from, the penalty of your sin. And that that means that you have you're in right standing with God because of what Jesus did on the cross for you in dying and not just dying there, but feeling the full weight of the punishment of death for you and for me. I love if you if you know Jesus and you're and, you, and, and, and you're safe, you're confident in your salvation, but you don't have. A body of believers to belong to, you're going to be Moses up there on the hill with your arms shaking and nobody help hold them up. Trust me, ask me how I know. If you need a church, you need some people, you can call it a church if you want to. Like you need a gathering, a group of people who love the Lord and who love you without expecting anything from you. You want to be a part of New Mount Zion. I would love to be your pastor. I'd love to be your friend. I'd love to help lead you through the word and help you through the challenges that come to you in life. And just as people have held me up, I want to be there to hold you up. That's what we do at New Mount Zion. It ain't about coming in and people looking alike. Or it's about people who are united in a cause of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have somebody to fight while you're praying, you need a church. You don't want to do this alone. If you don't have somebody who's close enough to you to watch you and see you falling apart, you're doing it the hard way, my brother, my sister. Don't do it. You need somebody to help you. Even Moses, the father of the faith, lofty Moses, would have fallen down. His arm might have fallen and two million people might have entered into another kind of slavery. But God is faithful and he gave him people he could depend on. And I want you to know that wherever you are in the world, we've got people watching in over a dozen countries now, that there are people you can depend on. 
And I'm just raising my hand right now saying, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to know you. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to support you because God has been so good to me. I got some, I got, I got a little, a little extra left in the tank for you. And if you've been in a situation where you've been hurt by people who have called on the name of Jesus, who didn't represent these values that I just told you that Jesus is perfection without, 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 without condemnation, just trying to be loving and show the love of God. And it's perfect. I want to tell you, I'm sorry that you've been hurt by folks that have been calling on the name of Jesus. And I'm not inviting you to nothing like that. I'm inviting you to a group of people who helped me in a time where I'm a wild well, first time pastor, didn't know what I was doing. I ain't never passed it through nothing, let alone the pandemic. But I got some errands and I got some hers and some Joshua's around me. And if you don't, please, my brother, my sister, don't try to do this by yourself. I'm not saying that you're not going to survive, but I am going to say you're going to be more tired than you should have been. That's all I got for you. That's uh, those are our, that's the three. Uh, that's, that's really, do you need to be saved? Do you need somebody or do you need a, a body of believers that's going to help you? If you're not watching this live, you see my emails on the screen. It's also in the description on Facebook and on YouTube. Pull up, man. Write me, write me a message. Better yet, if you're watching right now, click on that Zoom link and I'll meet you in that Zoom room right now. And we can start talking, start building that relationship wherever you are in that continuum. Of, in a time of oppression and depression, you're in a time of doubt and fear. You're in feeling internally struggled. You feel like you're being attacked externally or you're not sure how you're going to win this battle. Wherever you are in that spectrum, God is enough. And I want you to know that. I want you to have that assurance. Y'all feel me a little bit? Why don't we pray? God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray like Moses. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to come to you, God, bearing our sins, bearing our inadequacies, our fears, our faults, our flaws, and our failings. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for empowering me, Lord, to be a pastor, to be a friend, to be a mentor to so many, Lord. And I pray, Father God, that you would help us to help each other. Purge us of that pride that tries to make us try to do everything, the fear that makes us think that, that, that we can't help, sense of inadequacy that pushes us back, help us to get in position to meet your needs and the needs of the people who are coming. I pray that as people come to this ministry, we receive them with the spirit of humility and love, just the way we want to be treated. I pray for the one who's struggling about accepting your love. God, help them, please. Holy Spirit, I pray that they would that, the, as, that as you touch their heart, that they would not harden it, Lord, but they would turn to you as their only Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, that if it's your will, if this is the place for them, Lord, that this be the place where they set up roots and grow as people, let it be according to your will. So, Lord, we love you. I thank you and praise you. I know that you've done what you said you would do, so I'm all good. Releasing it to you, Father God, and trusting you completely. Lord, we love you, honor you, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen one more again. Amen. That's what I got for y'all today, man. Thank you guys so much again uh, for, for your prayers and your patience with me the last couple of weeks while I've been trying to recover. Um, you, just, you guys, you know, you are the, you are the model kind of, kind of people that, that, you know, you just have no idea how much it means. For your love and your care and your faithfulness, your kindness, your prayers, it makes it it makes it a little easier to hold up them hands. Amen. So I love you guys. I'm gonna go ahead and step into the um, Zoom room here in just a second. If you want to support the ministry, the links are in the description. Um, if you don't have it, don't give it. Amen. And if you're part of this fellowship and you're struggling, let me know. Let one of the deacons know so we know we can help you. We're not just trying to take it in so we can look at the bank and know that we got money. This is so we can help. We're, we're, we're saved to serve. So if you're struggling, know that those people who are giving are giving so that we can help you. So if you don't let us know there's a need, we ain't go, we don't know what to meet. All right. Please let us know. Amen, somebody. Um, and on Sunday, we'll be in the sanctuary. It'll be our family and friends day. And we have uh, Pastor Ernest. Jo Give me a break, Momo. Pastor Ernest Johnson's going to be coming. Um, and he's going to be preaching for us and, um, 
and I'm sure his church will be coming along with him. So meet us at the church at 11 a.m. on Sunday for Family and Friends Day. Hang out for some refreshments after the service. And uh, for the members of New Mount Zion, remember that uh, we're going to be keeping an eye on how many people each member has invited. And there'll be a prize for the uh, we'll, we'll do, we're going to do our best to get a prize for the one who brings the most folks. Amen. And invite somebody that don't go to church. Why don't you? OK, don't just get people to come from other folk church. That's cool and everything. But if you know someone who you love, part someone in your family, a friend of yours that doesn't have a church home, man, invite them to the place. If you feel good about being fed at New Mount Zion and, and love the people there, let somebody else know. Amen. All right, you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Like I said, I'm going to step out of the uh, step out and go and step into the Zoom room and talk with those who want to make decisions for Jesus. Uh, be praying for them as we get ready to go. All right. Y'all have a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you on Sunday morning at New Mount Zion 11. All right? Love y'all. Bye, everybody.